Namaste, dearest introverts. My name is Trey. This channel is Experiential Energy Anatomy. And this video is going to be a continuation of a little book club share series that I guess I am starting in regards to the fantastic, fantastic work by Thomas More about archetypal psychology called Care of the Soul. And I'll put a link in the description box to the first book club share video I did in regards to chapter three, narcissism and the myth of narcissus. And I just like to open up this book at random in order to see uh, what the spirit feel we need to focus on. And today's chapter is chapter six, titled The Soul and Power. So I definitely think that if you are familiar with some of my tarot readings, if you are familiar with any of my video content, I definitely talk a lot about what Carl Jung, the founder really of archetypal psychology, would call the road of individuation, psychosynthesis, or the fool's journey, as is represented in the tarot. So I definitely thought that uh, this content today would resonate with people who are on that often challenging soul expansion, soul growth journey. So if this doesn't interest you, welcome. Okay, chapter six, the soul and power. In the soul, power doesn't work the same way as it does in the ego and will. When we want to accomplish something egoistically, we gather our strength, develop a strategy, and apply every effort. This is the kind of behavior James Hillman describes as heroic or Herculean, as in related to Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> he means the word in the bad sense, using brute strength and narrow rationalistic vision. The power of the soul, in contrast, is more like a great reservoir, or in traditional imagery, like the force of water in a fast rushing river. It is natural, not manipulated, and stems from an unknown source. Our role with this kind of power is to be an attentive observer, noticing how the soul wants to thrust itself into life. It is also our task to find artful means of articulating and structuring that power, taking full responsibility for it, but trusting too that the soul has intentions and necessities that we may understand only partially. So I, I love this first paragraph just because it is setting the scene to open up a dialogue about what is power and that you know there's so much social programming via violence in movies, which this chapter definitely talks about violence, so we'll get into it in a bit, but um, how do power structures work? Who has power and how do they have power? And I think um, a lot of the way that we are educated, especially in the West, um, it's a misdirection away from this type of power, this alternative um, soul power that Thomas More is talking about. It has nothing to do with brute force. It has nothing to do with weapons. It has nothing to do with war. It's a subtle power. And I just think it's really setting the stage quite beautifully. So let's continue. Neither ego-centered will on the one hand nor pure passivity on the other serve the soul. Soul work requires both much reflection and also hard work. Think of all the ancient cultures that pour masses of money, materials, and energies into pyramids, megaliths, temples, and cathedrals on behalf of sacred play or holy imagination. The trick is to find the soulful perspective that feeds action with both passion and imaginal contemplation. I am reminded here of Jung's constant attempt in both his theory and in his own life to discover the transcendent function, as he called it, a point of view 
that embraces the mysterious depths of the soul as well as conscious understanding and intention. This for Jung was exactly what self means. It is a fulcrum of action and intelligence that feels the weight both of soul and of the intellect. This is not a mere theoretical construct. It can be, as Jung showed in his own soul work, a way of life. The power that comes from this relocation of the source of action has profound roots and is not destructively caught up in narcissistic motives. The Tao Te Ching, 30, says, the good general achieves his result and that's all. He does not use the occasion to seize strength from it. Let me repeat. The good general achieves his result and that's all. He does not use the occasion to seize strength from it. Tapping the soul's power has nothing to do with the <coughs> excuse me, has nothing to do with the need to fill gaps in the ego or to substitute lamely for its loss of power. What is the source of this soul power and how can we tap into it? I believe it often comes from unexpected places. It comes first of all from living close to the heart and not at odds with it. Therefore, paradoxically, soul power may emerge from failure, depression, and loss. The general rule is that soul appears in the gaps and holes of experience. It is usually tempting to find some subtle way of denying these holes or distancing ourselves from them. But we have all experienced moments when we've lost a job or endured an illness only to find an unexpected inner strength. Wow, so this is just drawing. We'll take a pause here. And if you have a beverage, sit. <laughs> this passage is drawing my memory to the strength part and the tarot. And that, you know, psychosynthesis, what does it mean? It means that when you are shattered, when you feel like your soul has gone through a ne what we perceive as a negative experience that has left you emotionally, psychologically shattered, that that's actually an invitation from spirit in order to connect with the power of the soul, to connect with your inner strength in order to resynthesize the broken pieces, in order to perhaps change your perception of what we label loss, grief, etc., as a catalyst for change a catalyst for evolution, which I think is very relevant on this planet in the current point of space and time. How can we look at Earth events rather than with sadness and grief in order to see, wow, maybe this is, again, an invitation for us to evolve. Maybe these are the catalysts of change in the cyclical energies that are necessary in order for us to move forward as a collective in order to again deconstruct false beliefs and about power and that have been programmed by patriarchal power structures uh, i think uh patriarchy as a system or a style of social organization really in the words of dr carmen bolter has been a failed experiment for the past uh, 6,000 years and that that is clear that it has failed and therefore I think the fact that patriarchy is on its last broken down leg that it is a system that is already dead and the illusion is that it somehow still functions I think this is also bringing the collective's awareness to who has power actually how does that word power actually function within socioeconomic and political systems because the way that we are taught that power structures function is not how they actually function. And if you have ever been involved, for example, I lived in Washington DC for seven years. It becomes very obvious, regardless of if you are even working in the government, that who has power and who doesn't, it's all perception. 
it is all a perception at the end of the day. And I just think it's very interesting um, the content that Thomas More is offering us that is, again, it's inviting us to have a think, really sit down and rethink, okay, what is power? Other sources of deep-rooted power are simply concrete peculiarities of personality or body or circumstances. One person has a deep resonant voice that takes him places in the world. Another is clever, intelligent in his own way, and imaginative. Some people have a sexual attractiveness that doesn't have to be exploited in order to bring power into life. Sometimes a young person in need of power will look to conventional places for it and overlook her own inherent qualities. She tries self-consciously to talk smoothly and to appear comfortable when in fact she's anxious and full of self-doubt. The assumption in some quarters is that if you can affect a cool appearance, power is sure to follow. But these crude evocations of strength and confidence inevitably fall apart, and the person is immersed even more deeply in a vat of insecurity. Okay. Soulful emptiness is not anxious. In fact, power pours in when we sustain the feeling of emptiness and withstand temptations to fill it prematurely. We have to contain the void. Too often we lose this pregnant emptiness by reaching for substitutes for power. I'm gonna repeat that again. Too often we lose this pregnant emptiness by reaching for substitutes for power. A tolerance of weakness, you might say, is a prerequisite for the discovery of power, for any exercise of strength motivated by an avoidance of weakness is not genuine power. This is a rule of thumb. The soul has no room in which to present itself if we continually fill all the gaps with bogus activities. Okay, that's very, very interesting. So then it's just talking about the ways in which the ego is programmed to seek distractions. Um, I think that's something that Thomas More, I personally am interpreting this as. You, of course, can have your own interpretations, always. But I just feel that in modern Western capitalistic materialism, the way that that perception programs people, it's constantly programming them to feel that if I'm not busy, if I'm not distracting myself with some type of activity, I am worthless. And it is actually in moments where you feel again that emptiness that Thomas More was saying, that's when soul can come in. That's when soul can manifest. Those are the opportunities that I think the Tao Te Ching, um, which I love the Tao, it's such a beautiful, beautiful wisdom tradition. There's a concept from the Tao that it's called not doing. <laughs> and that's so counterintuitive to the Western program mind in order to, we're, we're so programmed to do. To do, 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 do. Work, 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 work. Produce, 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 produce. Buy, 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 buy. Sell, sell, sell. And that is actually soul crushing. That is that doesn't allow soul to actually um, manifest again and experiences that you have. And so by, I think what Thomas More is saying here is that in order to care for your soul, in order to reconnect with the soul's power, sometimes it requires not doing. Sometimes it requires, um, you know, letting things play out, letting events around you, um, play out as they will in order to observe the energy before you decide to act. And I just think that's um, what I interpret this passage as. And it's also interesting, like he was mentioning, uh, talking about, again, like the perception of power and how so many people, uh, especially if you study, right, politics, and how image is so important for someone who's trying to run for president to come off as being a masculine, strong figure who talks a certain way and has hand gestures of this nature, right? 
There's so much. There are professionals in Washington, D.C. in body language who teach politicians about these things. There are um, professional linguists who help teach politicians how to speak in a certain way. All to convince the public that when they are watching them on television, that they have what power, and it's a perception, right? So it's a very shallow perception, in my opinion, like he was saying, um, what it means to be cool, quote unquote. <laughs> um, because at the end of the day, I feel that people who actually have power within patriarchal structures are not on the television. <laughs> people on the TV are the puppets and they are the ones who have their scripts and they are the ones who are told what to say in order to receive their paycheck. <laughs> and I just think that is the true nature of power within those systems. But again, Thomas More is talking here about a different type of power, the soul power. So how do we listen to the soul? How do we, in our lives, recognize when the soul is trying to communicate with us, like its desires? When the soul is trying to communicate with us when we are ignoring it, how do we listen to the soul? So the next section is called the logic and the language of the soul. One of the central difficulties involved in embarking on care of the soul is grasping the nature of the soul's discourse. The intellect works with reasons, logic, analysis, research, equations, and pros and cons. But the soul practices a different kind of math and logic. It presents images that are not immediately intelligible to the resonating mind, such as dreams, for example. It insinuates, offers fleeting impressions, persuades more with desire than with reasonableness. In order to tap the soul's power, one has to be conversant with its style and watchful. The soul's indications are many, but they are usually extremely subtle. Two Sufi stories demonstrate how odd the logic of the soul can appear to reasoning, to the reasoning heroic mind. So let's focus on the second story. So, for the sake of time. Okay. The other Sufi story is more mysterious. Nuri Bey was a reflective and respected Albanian who married a wife much younger than himself. One evening when he had returned home earlier than usual, a faithful servant came to him and said, your wife, our mistress, is acting suspiciously. She is in her apartment with a huge chest, large enough to hold a man. Grr. <laughs> Scandalous. <laughs> Which belonged to your grandmother. It should contain only a few ancient embroideries. I believe that there may now be much more in it. She will not allow me, your oldest retainer, to look inside. Nuri went to his wife's room and found her sitting disconsolately beside the massive wooden box. Will you show me what is in the chest, he asked because of the suspicion of a servant, or because you do not trust me? Would it not be easier just to open it without thinking about the undertones? Asked Nuri. I do not think it is possible. Is it locked? Yes. Where is the key? She held it up. Dismiss the servant and I will give it to you. Meow. <laughs> the servant was dismissed. The woman handed over the key and herself withdrew obviously troubled in mind. Nuri Bey thought for a long time. Then he called four gardeners from his estate. Together they carried the chest by night unopened to the distant part of the grounds and buried it. The matter was never referred to again. So before we read Thomas More's analysis, we'll take a little pause, sit. And why don't you have a little meditation about what you feel the deeper undertones of this Sufi story are.
Okay, let's continue, yes? This is a captivating and mysterious story. Again, I don't know if there is a canonical, canonical, referring to the word canon, <laughs> reading. To me, it shows the soul, typically represented by the woman, as the vessel of mystery. The older man, the Senate, wants to open this vessel and have the mystery explained. Typical. Also, as in the story of the music lesson, there is some shadow in the story. The suggestion that there could be a man in this chest. Like, I mean. <laughs> or is it that whatever vessel the wife has can hold humanity or a person, as though it were the envelope of the human soul? The wife, again, speaking for the soul, inquires into the fantasies of her husband about the chest. But in typical Hercules fashion, he wants to dismiss the undertone and go directly to a literal solution. Just open the box, woman. <laughs> How many times do we lose an occasion for soul work by leaping ahead to final solutions without pausing to savor the undertones? I want to repeat that. How many times do we lose an occasion for soul work by leaping ahead to final solutions without pausing to savor the undertones. We are a radically bottom line society, eager to act and to end tension, and thus we lose opportunities to know ourselves for our motives and our secrets. From the wife's point of view, it's simply not possible just to open the chest without taking the undertones into consideration. But she has the key. Jung says that the anima is the face of the soul. In this story, she is the one who can open and close the container. The tension centers around whether or not the man will force an opening of the box. Do we need to expose everything that is hidden? Do we need to understand all mysteries? We are used to hearing about the great revelations of science, the discovery of atoms, particles, and DNA. And so quite naturally, we think that the mysteries are there to be solved. The alternative seems strange, but at the same time, it has its own appeal. Use our intelligence and skill to preserve the mysteries. So, We'll just pause there, and this is very, this is going on a very interesting road here in Thomas More's analysis of the story. So, just to give a little bit of info, for those who are not familiar with the term anima, in archetypal psychology, um, Jung um, perceives the soul as having a masculine and a feminine aspect, and that the anima is the hidden or feminine aspect, the face of the soul. And the animus is the masculine aspect, the instinctual aspect, okay? Um, so it's just something to think about, as he said, as the woman, the wife in the story of Nuri Bey is representing the anima of the soul. She is representing um, the mystery of the soul. And I think it's a beautiful, it's, it's a beautiful, a story that again it's inviting us to know that the nature of the mysteries are not meant to be solved that's why they're called a mystery we can talk about them we can theorize about them i mean it's fun to discuss them i, I call it like brain candy but ultimately at the end of the day uh they're beyond human comprehension they're beyond the human's mind they're beyond the human's capacity to fully perceive they're just things in this universe which we really, as humans, are only perceiving the tip of the iceberg, right? There's so much mass of the soul, of the subconscious mind below the water, that, that there's so much of the iceberg that we don't see, we only see the tip. But it doesn't mean that it's not real, it doesn't mean that it's not there, it's just a mystery, right? And we can scratch the surface, of the mystery, given what we see, the tip, what we perceive, right? But 
ultimately they call it a mystery for that reason because there are just things that sometimes like they say like pandora's box what is that myth talking about it's like you know if you open up the box man's desire man's curiosity to know right sometimes as we will continue that can be a dangerous uh force this is a teaching story because we are taught in the end how to deal with the stuff of the soul. Nuri Bey thinks for a long time. He creates his own inner space with his reflection, and then he is ready for the kind of action that is appropriate for the soul. He calls four gardeners. You would have understood the number four here as a symbol of wholeness, or like the four directions, the four cardinal signs, as it is in the world card of the tarot. They carry the chest at night to a distant place where they bury it and never discuss it again. We think that power comes from understanding and unveiling, but we should know from the story of Oedipus that this approach only goes so far. Oedipus solved the riddle of the Sphinx, but then he was blinded and only afterwards slowly came to appreciate the mysteries that are beyond the scope of reason. From the point of view of soul, it is just as important, maybe more important, to check the urgency of curiosity and suspicion, to allow certain things to remain distant and buried, to trust one's soulmate or mate soul with things that shouldn't be brought to the light of day. A man told me once about the woman he was in love with. They had had a quarrel and he had sent a rash, thoughtless letter to her in the heat of his distress. Before the letter arrived by mail, he telephoned her and asked her to not read the letter. <clears throat> she told him later that the letter had arrived and she had torn it up immediately. She had felt enormous curiosity and on the torn, crinkled paper lying in the wastebasket, she could see the scribbles of his writing. She confessed she was tempted but she let it go unread. At that moment, the man told me he felt they had an unbroken bond between them. Their relationship had been tightened by her reverence. When he told me the story, I thought of Nuri Bey and the special lesson and the power of soul he learned in his moments of thought when it was decided for him that the chest remained closed. These stories show that power is not always revealed in action. Nuri Bey could easily have overpowered his wife and discovered her secrets, but by preserving her privacy, he maintains his power. In general, we keep our power when we protect the power of others. That's so powerful. Wow. It's starting to pour. Excuse me, so I'm just going to shut the door. Give me one second. I live in the rainforest and it is rainy season, so it is pouring down, but it's perfect vibe for a book club. Perfect vibe for a book club video. So I just want to repeat that last bit. In general, we keep our power when we protect the power of others. This is the biggest Achilles heel, the biggest fault in patriarchy, which is based on what? Power over structures versus empowerment. I feel it is safe to say, if you actually study matriarchal prehistoric cultures, such as, again, one of my heroes, Dr. Carmen Bolter, uh, it is safe to say that those cultures stress balance, and it was not the opposite of patriarchy in which women were dominating men. It was about balance between the perceived opposites and about empowering the people. There was a general uh, mantra, one could say, 
If it's not good enough for everybody, if it's not good enough for the collective, then it's good enough for no one. And again, it's the opposite in patriarchy, which is the 1% power structure. There are a small groups of elites whose only concern is in continuing the institutions of patriarchy is in order to hold on to the privilege and the benefits, the power that they receive from those institutions, from those power structures. Even though it is raping the planet, even though there is such a big inequality in resources and wealth, even though, again, it is disempowering the majority of the planet, those patriarchs do not care, right? Because they have, frankly, sold their souls in order to maintain powers within a broken down system. And again, it's just, when I'm gonna repeat it one more time because it's so juicy. In general, we keep our power when we protect the power of others. So when you care about empowering the people around you in your life, when you care about not falling into toxic codependent power dynamics within relationships, when you, again, care about not only your soul, but the soul growth of the people around you within your community, that is attracting soul power to yourself indirectly, right? That, I think that word indirect is very key here when we're talking about not doing the message of the Tao. Like, how does this soul power actually work? I think it's more subtle. It's more indirect. It's about, for example, um, let's just say, let's just throw out an example here, right? Of you live in a neighborhood community, right? Okay, why does every single house need to have a power drill? <clears throat> why, why does every single house need to have their own power drill? Could people share the power drill? You know, could, could, there be a could there be community tools, right, that we all have access to? How is that empowering the community, right, by spending less money, by spending less resources? You know, I just think it's, it's things like that, that matriarchy really forces us to think about how is power distributed amongst people? Um, Dr. Carmen Bolter said something really important, I think, about matriarchal prehistoric society as well. I'll put a link in the description box to some of her work, because it's fascinating work. And she said that in matriarchal societies, the person who ruled or had the position of power, which was always distributed amongst um, did multiple people. It wasn't just one person, first off. But those groups of people were always considered the most conscious. They were not doing it because it paid a lot of money. They were not in positions of power because they necessarily wanted to be in positions of power. They were viewed as the most conscious and were offered the responsibility of managing the welfare of the community or the group. Okay, it had nothing to do about lusting for fame, lusting for money, lusting for power, which so clearly played out in the joke that the American political system became in the last two election cycles. It became, frankly, a uh, like reality TV show. Like, <laughs> it was like celebrity president <laughs> instead of celebrity apprentice. Anyways, tangent. But that leads us into a good transition into the next section that I really wanted to talk about because it was so interesting. It was called Violence and the Need for Power. The word violence comes from the Latin word vis, meaning life force. So I love this book, Just Pause, because it talks so much about etymology the linguistics of words and how that affects the psyche. Continuing on. Its very root suggests that in violence, the thrust of life is making itself visible. If that fundamental vitality is not present in the heart, it nevertheless seems to appear distorted by our repressions and compromises, our fears and our narcissistic manipulations. 
It would be a mistake to approach violence with any simple idea of getting rid of it. Chances are, if we try to eradicate our violence, we will also cut ourselves off from the deep power that sustains creative life. Besides, psychoanalysis teaches repression never accomplishes what we want. The repressed always returns in monstrous form. The life current of the soul, beast, is like the natural force of plant life, like the grass that grows up through cement and in relatively short time obliterates grand monuments of culture. If we try taming and boxing in this innate power, it will inevitably find its way into the light. Repression of the life force is a diagnosis I believe would fit most of the emotional problems people present in therapy. Let's repeat that. Repression of the life force is a diagnosis I believe would fit most of the emotional problems people present in therapy. These days, it is common for therapists to encourage their patients to express their anger almost as if they were doing this through, almost as if doing this were a, a panacea. Where I don't know there. I am human after all. But I suspect that anger and its expression are only a route into the force of life that has become attenuated and difficult for people to feel in our modern society. Renaissance doctors place both anger and the life force under the aegis of one god, Mars. All people they taught have an explosive force ready within them to be unleashed into the world. Simply being oneself, letting one's individuality and unique gifts come forth is a manifestation of Mars. When we allow ourselves to exist truly and fully, we sting the world with our vision and challenge it with our own ways of being. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Love that. In entertainment and in politics, we sometimes see persons of exceptional talent <laughs> burst onto the public scene with irrepressible energy and imagination. Just being themselves. They stagger us with their brilliance. A metaphor often used for their appearance on the scene is meteoric. They flash, burn, and streak across our tame and timid world. We say these people have charisma, a word that means divine favor and gift. Their power is not from the ego. What we see in such people is a divine light burning in their personalities and in their actions. But throughout human history, the expression of individuality has been felt as a threat to the status quo. For all its expressed championing of the individual, our culture in many ways favors conformity. We are pleasantly sedated by the flatness and predictability of modern life. You can travel far and wide and have a difficult time finding a store or restaurant that is even mildly unique. In shopping malls everywhere, in restaurant districts, in movie theaters, you will find the same clothes, the same brand names, the same menus, the same few films, the identical architecture. On the East Coast, you can sit in a restaurant seat identical to that you sat in on the West Coast. Yet, as psychoanalysis says, repetition is death. Repetition defends against the rush of individual life. It seeks the deadly place of, of it seeks the deadly peace of a culture that has banished surprise. Wow. You know, if you have ever lived in the American nine to five culture, right? I think you would agree with the statement that repetition is death. <laughs> death of the soul. What's that say? What's that phrase when you're like, hey, John, when you're in the office and you're to your coworker, hey, John, how's it going? Same shit, different day. <laughs> That's what Thomas More is talking about here, people. Okay, let's continue, yeah? 
It is not unusual for repressed forces and symptoms eventually to reappear as objects. That is, our fantasy becomes crystallized in a thing that has the power and lure of a fetish. Meow. In this sense, our nuclear arsenals with their mystery and threat are dark carriers of what has been ignored in the soul. Bombs and missiles give us a constant daily association with our own destruction. They are reminders that everything cannot be contained and controlled, that as a society we can kill ourselves and obliterate other peoples and the planet itself. This is an unprecedented fetish of power. The Jungian analysis or analyst Wolfgang Geigrich, forgive me I don't speak German, has drawn a parallel between the bomb and the golden calf of Genesis. Can I just say how ironic that is that the thunder happened right as I said Genesis? Like, pause, sit. <laughs> Both are idols. Geigerich notes that the calf was actually a bull, an image of unlimited animal power. But he says, in that mythic moment when Moses destroyed the bull, we banished dark power and set up altars only to the light. Our bombs, then, are a continuation of the ostracized golden calf. Because we have refused to associate ourselves with the darker forces, they have been forced into fetishistic form, where they remain, fascinating and lethal. I see a connection, therefore, between our seemingly insoluble violence and our treasured repetitious flatness. The soul, tradition has taught for centuries, needs the profound and challenging grace of Mars, who reddens everything in his vicinity with the glow of passionate life, brings a creative edge to every action, and sows the seeds of power in every moment and event. When Mars is overlooked and undervalued, he is forced to appear in fetish and in violent behavior. Mars is infinitely greater than personal expression of anger. Creative and destructive, he is life itself poised for struggle. There is nothing neutral about the soul. It is the seat and the source of life. Either we respond to what the soul presents in its fantasies and desires, or we suffer from this neglect of ourselves. The power of the soul can hurl a person into ecstasy or into depression. It can be creative or destructive, gentle or aggressive. Power incubates within the soul and then makes its influential move into life as the expression of soul. If there is no soulfulness, then there is no true power. And if there is no power, and there can be no true soulfulness. Wow. You know, this is just really random, but I'm thinking of that Lionel Del Rey album, Ultraviolence, and I'm now kind of understanding the deeper themes of that. But, you know, we're 44 minutes deep, so I think I'm just gonna let you sit with that content versus me giving any of my interpretations. You can interpret that last passage as you will. Again, my name has been Trey this channel, Experiential Energy Anatomy, and I hope that you enjoyed this edition of Book Club Share featuring Thomas More's Care of the Soul. May you have a beautiful, high vibe day. Namaste.